your mic in. That would help. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mac McCarthy, and I help people with their breakups. And today, very, very interesting topic. As I always say, they're all interesting, right? Making marriage work. And this was actually recommended the Gottman method uh, by the great Pete in the Discord that I have going right now. Coach Mac McCarthy Discord. The link is in the live stream here and also in the notes below. And I also put a link to a video about the Gottman method with Mr. Gottman. Uh, and also um, another link to their website, the Gottman method, about the Gottman method. And I'm going to unpack this fully today because I think it's interesting. So if you like this video, throw me a like. If you don't like it, that's fine. Have an opinion about it. Subscribe if you want to subscribe. And if you want to book a live coaching session, well, then go down below punch the link and go to writemac.com, W-R-I-T-E-M-A-C.com. Send your story in and you could get my take in a public YouTube video, a private YouTube video for your eyes only. Or if you want to book a live coaching session where we talk on Skype or FaceTime and fully unpack your breakup, your story, what went down, why, how you're feeling and how you want to fucking move forward. If that's the case, that's usually music to most people's ears. I do do that for a generous fee. So getting into it today, making marriage work. So first off, I watched a, a video, like I said, that's on the discord that um, was titled making marriage work. And Mr. Gottman, who I'm, I'm calling him Mr. Gottman because I, in all my greatness of my memory, I don't see where it says his first name here. But the gentleman who's come up with this method uh, is, you know, goes by Gottman, the Gottman Institute, a researched, a based approach to results. So the video, which is on YouTube, which he gives about a 45 minute talk, I believe, or 48 minutes. I watched it last night. Uh, it was good, uh, informative. Uh, I have some some negative comments about it and some positive content comments about it and neutral comments. And so. A lot of people think, okay, where's the data? Especially scientists, highly educated people go, where's the data? Where's the research? And there's a lot of value in that. I'm with you. And people will say at those levels, if I don't have data, I don't have research, then really I don't have any facts. Okay, I'm with you. So this this gentleman, Mr. Gottman, I'll call him, starts out his talk, which I which I liked the way he started. He said, "Look, I'm not a love guru. I'm a researcher." Now that's an I am statement. It's definitive. He's saying that this is what my research has showed me, and this is what I'm going on. And the research has been pretty compelling in in his case. Now what got me was the fact that he goes, we've researched over 3,000 couples over, I, I want to say 30 years. I could be wrong on this if someone wants to. But he said he's been doing this research for 30 years, 30 years plus. 3,000 couples is not that many. Now, for one person and one body of work to do uh detailed research absolutely impressive there was one thing missing though in his talk that really was a big hole for me and i didn't get a demographics so you so you talk to 3000 different couples you researched you questioned them you answered questions and by the way he explained that I believe it was something like, and don't quote me on this, I should have took notes, 80% or 70% tile that him and his colleague who conducted these, um, what do we want to call them, research-based uh, views of, of marriage, he said that they could tell, I think it was 90% of the time, if someone was going to get a divorce. 
Now, if you watch the YouTube video that's in the notes, take a look at the audience. This isn't one of those things where I'm like, oh, this was race driven or anything like that. No, I believe that there's 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 swaths of different little tribes and groups and subcultures that a lot of times I've talked to us before that don't necessarily have something to do with race. Someone could be in a subculture. I've talked about this before living in San Diego when I was in my early 20s. I had never been around surfing or, uh, you know, skateboarding culture that was such so big. It's a subculture. You know, these people would go to the beach every day. Uh, they would eat at certain places. There, there, was, there was different things about that, that subculture, that group. My point is the audience to me that was at his talk looked like there was no one below 30, first of all. Just if you, if you watch this video, there's no one below 30. I would say most people were mid-30s to mid-40s. All of them were dressed like squares, like very tie, shirt, clean cut. I would say it was predominantly white by like 90%. Um, and I'm just curious because I don't know. During his talk, he was making a lot of these general statements. Well, across cultures, across this. But if you, if you had 3,000 couples that you studied, what were their ages? What were their age groups? What was their race? And what was their, when I say subculture, what did they make money-wise? What was their employment? Because this is the thing. Some of the things he was mentioning, I felt like, and he was very anecdotal about his own marriage. So in all the research he did, he would come back to my wife and I, my wife and I, my wife and I will do this. And this guy's in his 60s. He had a yarmulke on. He's devout. Um, he's devoutly Jewish, which is fine. Um, that's a subculture, a, a group of people that are probably going to treat their marriages different than other people. And this is where people could watch something like this and go, oh, yeah, this is so true. But the reality is there was, I, there was nothing there for the guy in his early 20s or mid-20s. Someone says, well, what about that a lot of those people don't get married? There was something to this that made me think this guy made a method that would apply to him. And like I said, when you say you, when you say you've researched three thousand couples, what was the demographic on them? What was their age? What was their uh, jobs? What what was their uh, religions? These are all things that end up being problems in marriages. Well, if we if we're gonna be honest, everyone thinks it's infidelity might be number one. A lot of times, marriage. A lot of times, the beginning of the end is finances. Someone's either not making enough or someone's spending too much. And then it bleeds over into a lot of other things. This is repeatedly the case in a lot of marriages. And some, oh, money doesn't matter. Well, if you get married and then you have kids and then you have a house payment and then you have car payments and you have some kind of debt, it fucking matters. And it leads to a lot of stress. And then what happens is problems that were solvable before or negotiable before are no longer solvable or negotiable before because you're so goddamn angry about the financial issues. So I'm going to I'm going to unpack this Rosanna it's been a while I hope you're well. Um I'm going to unpack this a little bit and like I said the link to the Gottman method will be in the um show notes or below the the YouTube video I actually put a link up early today earlier before the stream started. So you know, it's interesting about this stuff when you come across it enough, someone does all this research, they do all this stuff, and I'm not discounting. I'll be I'll be really really honest with you all. I go into these things skeptical. I really do. I really go into someone goes, "Oh, this is the Gottman method. This is this is um this is a this is the number one uh study. The way it was presented to me on the Discord was it was it was the godfather of studies for married couples. And I'm skeptical. Now, skeptical means I'm a little bit negative about it. 
I'm not sure that it's going to apply to all marriages based on what I know about relationships and whatnot, but I'll take a look at it and I'll be as objective as possible. But I am skeptical because no matter who you are, you're biased based on your own religion and your upbringing and how you look at the world. And that's why myself or some of these other in interesting coaches that um, do YouTube channels or coaching or anything else you find, you can actually watch their videos and go, okay, this guy lines up with me or this woman lines up with me. We have a lot of same beliefs or we, we look at the world similarly. And then you can make kind of this educated choice of getting advice from them. The old school version would be like, oh, this person's uh, PhD, master degree level, um, and they've been a psychotherapist for 25 years. Go to them. This is, this is where things get messed up a little bit for some people. This particular guy, this Gottman guy, if I was married, which I haven't been married, so this is interesting me talking about marriage when I haven't been married. <clears throat> Based on the way he was talking in the 48 minutes, I would not go to him. Now, let me be clear. That's not because... I don't think his method could work for some couples. That's not the case. I wouldn't go to him because of the way he talked and some of his examples didn't resonate with me, especially the anecdotal things about him and his wife's arguments. Or he made it, I found it extremely cheesy. Oh, I, he product placed a book he wrote. Well, I wrote this book. 1,001 ways to be more romantic with your partner. And I thought, that's a fucking cheese whiz festival. Like, okay. And one of the suggestions I made, instead of giving your wife a dozen roses, you can give her one rose for 12 days in a row and write a letter. And I just went to myself, oh, God. Because I'm thinking, that's not me. And the... Four serious girlfriends I've had. I'm, I'm hesitant to say the first one because it was only a year. And good relationships that they were. And they were, you know, four years, three years, eight years. I would never send a rose 12 days in a row and write a letter, some kind of romantic letter. Well, why wouldn't you do that? Number one, it's just not me. Am I thoughtful and caring? Yes. Yeah, in my own way. I find it. I find something like that a bit cheesy, um, over the top, and the girlfriends that I've had in the past, it, they wouldn't be receptive to it. They wouldn't be angry, but they would be like, "What are you? What are you doing?" Like, they would rather get the twelve roses up front. They would rather just get one rose with one letter. So, does that mean his idea sucks? No, just means for me, yeah, no, no bueno. I wouldn't go there. And like I said, some of the things he was mentioning about his own relationship, for someone that's research-based, a lot of it was anecdotal about his own life. Now, myself, if you've watched my channel before or listened to my live streams, I do the same thing. I don't have a problem with that. In fact, it tells me a lot about the person and it helps me decide if I want to work with them or follow what they do because it gives me some insight. And when he's talking about some of his situations, I'm just going, yeah, that's just not me, right? Now, let me go through some of the things that he mentions on the Gottman Method Couples Therapy. So he mentions, this is from the website, and like I said, there's a link below, and I encourage you to investigate it on your own if you'd like to. The Gottman Method is an approach to couples therapy that includes a thorough assessment of the couple's relationship and integrates research-based interventions based on sound relationship house theory, okay? And then beyond that, therapists can learn how to become certified in the Gothman Method couples therapy. So that's where the sale comes in. The Gottman Method couples therapy. Number one, there's assessment where you talk to the individuals, you get to know their personalities. Then there's a therapeutic framework, therapeutic interventions. This seems very similar to most. Um, 
But w- one of the things that he hangs his hat on, or I believe him and his wife do, because I believe that they both um, are in the same line of work or field, if you will, they call it the Sound Relationship House. And it starts with create a shared meaning. And he calls it building love maps. How well do you know your partner's inner psychological world, his or her history, worries, stresses, joys, and hopes? Now, I like that. I like the way that's worded. I like the idea of it. I will say this. In my own experience and talking to other people, you can't really get into that in the first few months. And this is what happens a lot of times when someone breaks up after a year, year and a half, and it came out of nowhere. And you go, where the hell did that come from? You didn't really know him that well yet. It was still a discovery mission. So he's saying, build these love mats, get to know them, inner psychological, their history, their worries, their stresses, their joys, and their hopes. And this takes being a really good listener, if you ask me. But at the same time, you have to be honest with yourself. Do those things that are their meanings, are special to them? Are you are you willing to sacrifice or compensate some of the things you want to do in life to serve their wants and needs? And this is interesting to me because we'd all like to say, we'd all like to say that things should be equal. I, I mean, great idea. We'd all like to say we, we need to negotiate everything. From what I've noticed from afar in marriages, and this, I only got five people on deck, but the people that are listening right now, Hazel, I appreciate it. Roseanne, I appreciate it. Just give me some feedback on this. Individuals I know that have been married a while, someone in the marriage is giving in more than the other person probably 60 to 70% of the time. Maybe more. And I'm not saying it's the man or the woman. It could be either or. But there's usually someone in the marriage, especially marriages that last a long time, and I said usually because I'm not saying all, but from what I've noticed, someone that sacrifices more of what they want, a little bit of who they are, and takes the high road on big arguments and succumbs. Am I wrong or am I right? Now, when you get into some of these relationship methods, and here's the thing, this individual, if I'm correct, this Gottman character, or professional, I should say, his wife, if I'm correct, is also in the same field. So they line up crystal clear. They line up really, really nice probably in a lot of things. And in fact, when they're having an argument or a spat, it's actually research-based because he's using it in his work. Now, like I said, is there anyone out there? And please put it in the comments below if you watch this live stream later on. Is it not true that a lot of long-term relationships, look at your grandparents, your aunts, your uncles, coworkers, friends, family members, and you go, these people have been together, I don't know, let's just say over 10 years. Let's just say that that's a long-term relationship nowadays that's been uh, mildly to highly successful. 10 years is a pretty big achievement at this point in the world. But we get to 20 years, we get to 25 or 30 years. Tell me I'm wrong that it's not an equal relationship in the sense that people get to follow their bliss on both ends. There's usually someone that gets more of what they want, that gets to pick the neighborhood you live in, that gets to pick the vacations you go on, and even gets to pick the food you eat. Does that make sense? I I mean, it doesn't have to be the woman or the man. There's someone that, and it's not necessarily that someone cares less. And I'm not even sure, Hazel, that someone's not as fully committed. I know where you're coming from, so I'm not just discounting that comment. And thank you for chiming in. But what I'm saying is the relationship is 
the path is carved by the the way that people accept things and don't accept things from the get-go and if so someone's more willing to give in to the other person or accommodate the other person over a long period of time then that's gonna that's gonna continue to be the case and in some cases you build a relationship with someone that becomes a spoiled brat where they get their way so much so often it's just like if someone spoils a kid i've seen this before too you create a monster and then and then you know 15 10 years down the road you're like i don't like the fact that you don't take the garbage out you don't do the dishes you don't say thank you it's just about you well, this is where people get a little oblivious. It takes two to tango, and you helped create that situation by not having a problem in the beginning and not speaking up. But by the way, most relationships that are long, not all, especially marriages, there's one that sacrifices more than the other. And so when you get into these methods... And these different things, a lot of times it's like, let's figure out a way where everyone wins. Let's figure out a way where everything's negotiated. I'm not sure that that's entirely possible in most relationships. There's someone that's more dominant. There's someone that's more willing to go, hey, do this. And there's some people that just prefer not to fight. But what gets me is, these type of methods and these types of things, there's a demographic and there's a group that it lines up with. It doesn't line up for everyone. Like if this guy took the Gottman method and all its might and all its level and all its research, and again, I'm going to say 3,000 couples is, is, we got, I don't know, 7 billion people. There's I, I think there's 370 million in America. It's a droplet it's a droplet. It's a minuscule. It's a sand pebble. I know it sounds like a big number, but I, I would have to ask. And I, that, that to me, you're having a talk about this thing and you don't tell me the demographics. Race, religion, age, where they're from, where they live, backgrounds on these people. Oh, we did 3,000 couples. Really? Okay. Hazel says, it's rare that you find a match that both wants to put the effort from both sides. Maybe ego, maybe selfishness, or just not being empathized with, empathized with your partner. I agree. I agree. So, some things that are mentioned. Create a shared meaning. Build love maps. So, that would be ideal situation is... You both want, for example, this is an example. You both want two kids. I've had clients come to me and go, look, my wife doesn't want to have kids, but she's willing to have one for me. But I want to have three or four. That's a problem. Oh, can you negotiate that? Probably not. And if you do, and you, and you put someone in a situation where they have kids when they don't want to, career paths. There's career paths that don't line up. Let's say someone wants to be a cop and then the other person wants to be a chef or someone wants to be a nurse and the other person wants to be a career criminal. There's a lot of those out there. There's a lot of nurses that are with guys like that. They don't line up. People don't see it from the beginning. And then someone says, okay, like how can you build a love map from this? You can't. I think what's missing sometimes in these therapies too is the value in aborting immediately. Some of these things, when they don't line up, instead of working on them for years where, let's be honest, a lot of these couple therapists make a lot of fucking money from this. Hey, let's talk about this for three years. I know a guy that was in a marriage for 20 years. I believe it was 20, 20 plus years, had two kids, was miserable most of the marriage, but they had two kids. They had a lot of money. They lived in a prominent area in the world. And guess what? Let's do couples therapy. It was never going to work. They were so distant on so many things and so miserable with each other, but they went anyways. 
And that guy still has bitterness. So sometimes someone goes, oh, you know, you go to couples therapy, you make it work. Here's the one thing I will say, in my opinion. If you have kids, you owe it to your kids to, to give it an effort. And someone in the relationship needs to bite the bullet and go all the way and, and do their best. But if you if you're sacrificing your soul and who you are, that's a lot. And your kids are going to notice that. So there's a limit to that. I do believe you try. But what's missing in all this is a lot of times people get married out of lust and intimacy as the lure that hooked the fish. What do I mean by that? In your early to mid-20s, maybe even your 30s, I don't know for some people, but attraction and intimacy is what started the thing. You, you claim that you're very close. You claim that you have a good connection, but really in reality, you don't. Over time, you realize, actually, we don't. And then there's all these little landmines and booby traps of triggers from past events in your life. And someone I was just talking to was like, everyone has trauma in their life. I don't know if that's true. And certainly what's trauma to Judy Jack Burton or Hazel Chavez or Rosanna could not be trauma to me because it's all interpretation, folks. Right? Someone could get in a car accident that's really bad and have some serious injuries. And they'll go, you know what? I've discovered the meaning of life. And now I appreciate, you know, the birds and the bees, the flowers and the trees, the roses and the wine glasses and the peaches and the, you know, everything. It just changed them for the best. And someone else can go, oh, my God, I can never get in a car again. And the person that did this to me, uh, I want them to fry in hell. It's just interpretation. But you end up going out with someone. I've seen this. People can be married for seven, eight, nine, ten years. And this is my perspective from breakups, ground zero. Someone goes, I should have saw it coming in the beginning. But something comes up. Like, oh, I never knew you were had this much of a problem with my mom being a part of our kid's life. Well, does she, I was asking the guy, does she not like her mom? She hates her mom. Well, there you go. She always hated her mom. Yeah, it wasn't that good, but I just didn't know it would end up being this way. There's so much more intricacies to all this shit. But there is some value in someone going, this just isn't going to work. This just isn't going to work. So you can go to these methods. You can do all this stuff. Both people have to be on board. Both people have to make sacrifices. But this is what I'm saying. A lot of the relationships that I've seen go all the way or go a long way <laughs> One person made more sacrifices and one person got their way. Think about that. Is a completely equal marriage possible? Some would like to tell you that. Some would like to tell you that. All right, let me get into the live stream. I'll continue on this because I think this is a very interesting topic. Uh, prevention is key. Uh, it's rare that you match that both wants to put the effort from both sides. I said that maybe ego eight days by John Gottman. Was that a good book? I'm not, I'm not familiar with it. Prevention is key. Like older people second time around already experienced a lot that, and they are specifically looking for someone that wouldn't put them through it again, preventing disagreements. I think, I think as you go through relationships and have a few notice, I didn't say one, uh, each one gets you closer to the idea of what you may want, hopefully, and what you don't want, hopefully. Unfortunately for a lot of people, if their relationship was really traumatic, bad, abusive, um, manipulative, then a lot of times if they don't come to someone like myself and unpack the story and really get clear on what happened in that breakup, if they don't, then what they'll do is they'll sabotage future relationships, assuming that that's going to happen again and being overly alert to um, someone checking their phone and you going, let me check your phone. And then they're like, why are you checking my phone? And they're like, well, because my ex cheated on me and I found out they were sending naked pics to each other. Well, I'm not that way. See how this works? 
What I observed is that a lot of people are not with whom they want to be. Well, what I would say, Hazel, especially if people get married early, and this is what's detrimental to a lot of people, young people that go, I, I thought I was going to marry her. I don't know if you should, you should ever consider getting married in your early to mid 20s. I'm just not sure if people are at a position in their life where they know what they really want. Is it possible? Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Would it be ideal? Sure, I suppose so. Is it realistic in the 21st century in most areas? Ah, good question. Good question. I think sometimes people are with whom they want to be with until they're not. So your first couple of years could be rose petals and wine glasses, peaches and cream. We finished each other's sentences. We never fought. And then, dun, 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 dun. Oh, she started a new job at the bank, and the manager asked her out a few times, but she said she doesn't like him or anything. But then we went to the birthday party, and he was kind of all over, and I was uncomfortable. That's just the beginning. Alberto Rodriguez. Can I call you Al? What do you think about dating with different religious ideas of God? My ex, my girlfriend broke up with me last week because of religious beliefs. I have more open view and was willing to compromise, but she wasn't. There's your answer. There's your answer. You don't like it because you were like, I was willing to compromise. I was willing to be the bigger person. Wasn't enough. If someone's devout about politics or religion and they can't agree to disagree it's dust otherwise what are you going to do sacrifice your beliefs and become a doormat to your i mean you're just going to erase any part of your soul so that you could be in a relationship i'm sorry that's a pretty weak move you got to keep your dignity and your pride as an individual you are devout, Rob. I appreciate you. And the stream's getting better and better. Tell me I'm wrong. Some people work through their traumas and grow, but others stayed in the trauma stage forever. And some people are, st some people are triggered by a trauma that they didn't even know they had. There's so many options and so much abundance in the world i know i, I don't like that term abundance before but it's so true why create a situation that has so many hurdles you know it's like when people tell me they're in a relationship and they go oh she's got um depression or she's bipolar or this or that or and it's like have you ever had that before no but i want to be there for her Okay, did you do your best? Yeah, but she just keeps pushing me away. Move on. It's going to hurt. Yeah, it's going to hurt. Yeah, you did the right thing. If an individual is not receptive to your help and your good intentions, what's the other idea of, of, of moving forward? Relationships at their best are effortless. And then when something comes up, you both go, okay, let's work on this. And then if something comes up really bad, let's go, let's take a few days away from each other. Let's not, let's just, let's just get, catch our breath. But right there, Alberto Rodriguez, it's really good. You wrote what you wrote. Cause it's crystal clear to me. My question to you is what's not crystal clear to you. Do you think you can talk her out of the idea that she should compromise just had, a, just had a client. We did live coaching, and, and he unpacked his story here. The woman hysterically broke up with him because he voted for Trump. Hysterically went off on him. This is a young kid, 22, 23 years old. We had a live coaching session. Very smart guy. Had his reasons. Wasn't uh, and he, The kid was uh, actually half Thai. Um, half Thai, half Anglo-Saxon or Caucasian. Um, 
And, uh, you know, it's the same thing with politics. If you can't agree to disagree or meet somewhere halfway, it's dust. It's dust. And it's a big, bu- here's the thing. People are extremely self-righteous sometimes. What does that mean? It's my way or the highway. They have no room for any other belief. And you know what? Okay. Okay. What's the alternative? Is there a book out there that tells people, hey, um, if you're in a relationship with someone that doesn't line up with your religion, do this. That would be, you know what it would be? It would be some sort, some form of manipulation by like a CIA, CIA agent or something like that. That's not who you are, Alberto. It's tough. I get it. But that's one of those things when you take a temperature read on a scale of 1 to 10, you ask yourself this, Alberto, on a scale of 1 to 10, what's your attraction to this woman? 10 being the highest. Attraction being linked to how she looks, how you feel about her looks, and your intimacy. Number two, what's your connection or chemistry with this individual? How do you get along overall friendship-wise and and conversational on a scale of 1 to 10? If religion doesn't line up, I'd say this is a a, a 5. And then on a scale of 1 to 10, what is your trust level with this individual? When it comes to children, it makes all the difference which beliefs do you want to implement to your children. I agree, Hazel. And I'm not telling you what's wrong or what's right, but it would be nice if you could agree. Just like when 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 you had a parent, a good parent and a bad uh, good cop, bad cop type of deal with parents, or one of them lets the kid eat, you know, whatever he wants, and the other one's always trying to tell him he can't eat his sugar. It doesn't work. The kid's going. Well, I'm just going to go to the parent I like better and treats me better. All right, let's get back to this Gottman method. So the house, I wonder if I could, I don't know if I can show the screen. Nope, send feedback, no. Nope. All right, let me just read it off to you. So create shared meeting, make make life dreams come true. Some of this stuff, sometimes I'm like, you know, it's, you know, make your life dreams come true. Let's, you know, I'll tell you one of the things that a good marriage does. It, it deals with the fact of crisis, deaths in the family, illnesses in the family, traumas in the family, and you're there for each other. Make dreams come true. I would say that comes in second in most cases. This is one thing that I agree with wholeheartedly in his house of the sound relationship house. Make life dreams come true. And I was playing with that as being sarcastic. It's great. If everything works out, it should be there. Create shared meaning. Make life dreams come true. His next one was manage conflict, obviously. Accept your partner's inf- your partner's influence, dialogue about problems, practice self-soothing. So in this particular case, um, you know, when you get in arguments, be reasonable, listen, learn what your partner, how they communicate. I, I'm with you. The positive perspective is next. Turn towards instead of away. So this is where he talks about people giving someone the silent treatment. And I would say... Um, this one lines up the most and maybe overlooked. Share fondness, which is a heavy word. Share fondness and admiration, which means say fucking thank you. Say I appreciate you. Say I love you more and mean it in specific situations. And I think that that is overlooked in a lot of relationships. Um, that being said, everyone's affection levels are different. But I get what he means by that. That's one of those ones that everyone could do better, probably. Um, and then build love maps again. He writes, "No, no one others, another, no one, uh, one another's world." And when I when he says, "No one, one another's world," fuck, <laughs> no one another's world. Like I said, to me, 
someone's going to sacrifice a little bit more of what they want for the other person. Just seems like that's usually the case. And if later on in life, sometimes they're bitter about it. And you know what? They don't have the partner to blame. They have themselves to blame because they didn't speak up or they didn't make the first step. I've seen this a lot where someone's been married 25 years, 20 years. It's like, and, and my parents' age range. And all of a sudden, the, the woman that stayed at home with the kids is pissed because she didn't, she didn't get to go do um, a modeling career. Or she didn't ever get to go sing on Broadway or one of those things. And somehow, now that she's older, she goes, well, my husband did this to me, and actually uh, he was really controlling and this and this and this and this and this. That's one of those things that's like, uh, well, did you have the guts to walk out? Or the other frame is give yourself some credit for being a good parent and sticking it out. All right, Alberto Rodriguez. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's true. We were in an LDR. This is insightful. Thanks. We're both Christians, so it boggles my mind. I guess due to spending 17 days together, extended my stay, she didn't want me to leave. I even went to church to her church with her, met them all. It was so difficult. Met them all. That means it's a small church. It was all. It was difficult to break up. S- since both talked about our future of me moving closer in a few months to be physically closer and she agreed well let's just say this so i stayed longer she said wow this is great we have chemistry it's good to see you. we do great together and then she talked about her pastor a week after i got back and broke up with me after well if someone's going to be influenced by their pastor to break up that's a huge red flag um secondly LDRs where you haven't really met up that often, which I know are very common now based on the internet and web, uh, websites and dating apps and whatnot. Uh, they're extremely fragile. Extremely fragile. And so if you're like, oh, I'm so surprised, don't be surprised. It's not, it's not the relationship that's ideal on a lot of grounds. Can it work? Yes. Is it more likely to have something like this happen where you go, oh, I didn't know that about you? Absolutely. It's a long distance relationship. Dark night, always welcome. Gottman talks about night outs with the partner so you have intimacy and connection with the partner. I mean, this is one of those things where Isn't that obvious? Like, oh, yeah, you've heard many times from many people, oh, we've got to, you got to continue dating your partner. You got to continue the intimacy. Yeah, people have told me that before. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. It, it seems obvious. Sometimes it still doesn't work. Sometimes she still goes and fucks the uh, pool boy. Sometimes he still goes and uh, hooks up with the nurse because he's a doctor and she's cute. Sometimes all the stuff goes right and it still doesn't work. It does. It just does. Now, going back to his theory, let me get in his or his method. Build love maps. So build, I'm going to go through this quickly. How well do you know your partner's inner psychological world, his or her history, worries, stresses, joys, and hopes? I would hope over a couple of years, you, you kind of get to know that. Now, whether you give in to that in a way that's too much or too little, Is there a sweet spot where you meet in the middle? And this is where you guys should line up on a lot of things. But if someone, when you start dating someone, really listen about how they talk about their parents, how they talk about their brothers and sisters, and how they talk about their friends and colleagues, because you're next. Share fondness and admiration. The anecdote for contempt. This level focuses on the amount of affection and respect within a relationship. Express appreciation and respect to strengthen fondness. Yep, this is one of those things where people don't feel appreciated. It builds, it builds, it builds, and it builds. And a lot of men I've noticed that are in marriages go, I'm just walking on eggshells and I can't do anything right is a common statement. And that's one of those ones where... Women don't realize that they think because it's a man and he's masculine that he doesn't need appreciation or he doesn't need a pat on the back, and he's human. 
turn towards instead of away. State your needs. Be aware of bids for connection and respond to turns towards them. The small moments of everyday life are actually the building blocks of a relationship. Uh, the positive perspective, the presence of a positive approach to problem solving. Um, this seems obvious. Manage conflict. We say manage conflict rather than resolve it. Conflict because relationship conflict is natural and it has functional positive aspects. Understand that there is a critical difference in handling perpetual problems and solvable problems. God, there's a lot of big words there that doesn't make a lot of sense. Manage conflict means, you know, when you guys have a problem, talk about it, sit down and talk about it, listen to each other. If you can't solve it right away, give it some time. I mean, we don't need to use these huge words. Make life dreams come true. Create an atmosphere that encourages each person to talk honestly about his or her hopes, values, convictions, and aspirations. Sounds obvious. Create a shared meaning. Understand important visions, narratives, myths, and metaphors about your relationship. Ooh, trust. This is the state that occurs when a person knows that his or her partner acts and thinks to maximize the person's best interests and benefits, not just the partner's own interests and benefits. In other words, this means my partner has my back and is there for me. Here's where I don't know if I agree with this definition of trust. Again, there's a lot of times where one partner gives in more than the other. Commitment. This means believing and acting on the belief that your relationship with this person is completely your lifelong journey for better or worse, meaning that if it gets worse, you will both work to improve it. It implies cherishing your partner's positive qualities and nurturing gratitude by comparing the partner favorably with real or imagined others rather than trashing the partner by magnifying negative qualities. Wow. Okay. So like I said, I put that in the, the notes below if you want to check out the, the Gottman method. Things that stood out to me is that um, like I said, he talks a lot in, in the YouTube video about his own relationship and he talks about one of the places where they did this research. One of the places where they did this research was at the university and he said they created like a bed and breakfast atmosphere to observe the couples. And he said that we would just watch them while they had breakfast and read the newspaper. And he said that there was a beautiful view of a waterfront of some sort from the university it was at, I believe. I could be wrong, Washington University? Or uh, anyhow, the place where he they observed these couples 24 hours a day I believe he said it was like a bed and breakfast type setting. It was beautiful. And so is that realistic? So yeah, I know that this is a study data was collected, but is that a realistic setting to judge how couples act? Could it could could couples be acting different in those settings? And like I said, I really want to know the demographics and I really want to know if someone does a study and it's over 30 years, and it's 3,000 couples. Is 3,000 couples just a sand, piece of sand dust to the world's population? I mean, if data was found in that study, and he claims that from their studies that they could 90% 90, 90 of the time tell when someone was going to get divorced later on. By the way... And all my experience, and this might sound arrogant, I think if you lined up, I don't know, a hundred couples and you let me interact with them at a certain level or see how they act with each other, I could probably do that. 90% seems pretty high, but I could probably be pretty high up there by observing how they interact, how they talk to each other. The only thing that holds people back from getting a divorce a lot of times is the vows or financials or your kids. I would say a majority of people at at some point in the marriage do want to get a divorce because people just get sick of each other. I believe human beings evolved to be in tribes and small groups. And now what we've created is 
uh, couples that are like, I don't know, sometimes you even just have a couple, maybe one or two kids, and it dry, and you don't have interactions with grandma, grandpa, aunt, uncle. These are all things I think that were healthy before. Your neighbors even. Um, there's not as much camaraderie at a lot of people's workplaces, and so people are very attached or sick of their partners, which are both bad. All right, let me get into this. We're almost at the 50-minute mark. What's up, Jen? Thirsty. Well, you kind of train people how to treat you. I agree with that statement. Kind of. People take notes in the mental notes on what you're willing to accept. And one of the greatest, um, I don't know if it's a lesson or just statement that I remember from a college professor in junior college, but he was a Stanford grad, anthropologist, highly successful man, great orator, great, great lecturer. He said it's absolutely human nature to take advantage when you can. Think about that for a minute. Have you ever thought about that? Oh, that's not me. That's not how I am. Eh, well, that might be not how you are once you are in a certain set of rules and laws. Have you ever noticed, you know, I taught at a charity for about a year and a half, almost two years. <laughs> and I had the privilege to teach grade school, which is like first grade, second grade, third grade. And, and kids are fucking mean to each other. Why is that? And they take advantage of the weak kid. They'll steal his dessert. I mean, I remember I had this uh, one class. I think it was like P2. It was like, uh, what are they, six, seven years old? And my class, I like to have fun. I like to joke around, stuff like that. So I would let them, um, I don't know if you guys know, like the Chuck E. Cheese balls. <laughs> Does that make sense? They're not cheese balls, but they're plastic little plastic balls like people jump into at um, fun parks and things like that. And so we had these, we had a, a basket of those, like a big basket of them. We'd throw, throw them around the room and I, you know, you could throw them at each other. No one's going to get hurt. And it would always end up that the weak kid in class would just get the, there would be like four or five kids just drilling that kid with the balls over and over again. You'd have to be like, what are you guys doing? It's human in nature to take advantage when you can, say, pick on someone. But if someone gives and gives and gives, a lot of people will take and take and take, and then they'll be like, oh, my God. I get. It's called a covert contract. No more Mr. Geist Guy talks about this, where you feel like, I did this, this, and this, and they didn't even do that for me. Well, they just thought that you were, you know, you're an idiot. Rewarding the positive, ignoring the negative. One of my guy friends purposely sends me politically triggering messages. Some guys like tension. Well, there's a lot of people into that shit now. Judy Jack. Alberto Rodriguez, give her time. Sometimes people get scared of commitment just like guys. Please do not contact her and let her seat, sit, seat in her decision to see if she comes to you. Let her miss you. Great advice, Hazel. I appreciate that. I, I agree. You haven't contacted her? Ha, huh, I'm not like that. I just listened and let it happen. We met four times, physically been together. She's in avoidance, so I was patient, but I'm going to give it time. Uh, what's the alternative, right? Oh, yes, especially their relationship with their opposite sex parents. So key. <laughs> it's underrated. I was never aware of that. I was never aware of that. Uh, in my 20s, in my early 30s even. And now I look for it. Even people that you meet are friends. And they and the way they talk about their family, friends, and colleagues. I mean, it's one thing to have a problem or have a conflict, but when they are vigorously angry, upset, I hate my mom, we don't talk, that's a big one. <laughs> You're kind of like, okay. And, and by the way, I don't know what made that happen, so I'm not going to sit here and judge the individual. I'm not going to go, oh, you shouldn't do that.
Alberto Rodriguez, usually anxious part anxious partners hook up with avoidant, but be careful because a lot of people does not recommend those relationships because they caused a lot of pain and traumas. Dark Knight, sometimes it just comes down to I don't want to have a spaghetti. I don't want to have spaghetti anymore. As childish and immature as it sounds, people get bored and want to try something new. To be honest, I agree. I think that there's certain people that will eat spaghetti every day. There's certain people that like to go to the same places every day. So it's interesting you say that because not everyone's like that, but some people are. And I've read this before, and I think it's true. If you go out with someone that is quote-unquote adventurous, likes to travel a lot, likes challenges, is spontaneous, <laughs> guess what? They're more likely to cheat or, or abort the relationship because it's in their nature. Now, myself... I actually am one of those people, I go to the same restaurants. I've always been this way. I'll get tired of them after a while, though, sometimes if they change ownership or something like that. I'm extremely loyal in that way. Four or five places I'll go to regularly, and I'll know them by name, and I'll order the same things. I go hiking quite a bit. I like one particular trail more than the other ones, and friends, friends will be like, are you going to go on the same one again? Yeah, really? Don't you want to go on another one? Nope, I really like that trail. Where I live, there's a beautiful beach close by my house. People go, what, don't you want to travel to some other beaches? Nah, I kind of like the one I live by. Just how I am. It's not better or worse. So I'm probably more susceptible to be in a long-term relationship because that's how I'm, I'm dialed in. But Dark Knight, you're exactly right. You're 100% right. Um. There are individuals that are more apt to go. They It just gets old. It's just like eating the same meal every day. Yep. And that's when people go, oh, well, that's when you need change. That's when you need to build excitement. Yeah. And there's some relationships where people can be. There was a, a guy that did a call-in recently that's a, a college professor, I believe, in New York. And it sounded so great because he found someone else that was in his field of work, uh, they, they had similar things that like the best thing is when you have a, the more things that you have lined up that you share a joy for, well, then it's probably going to work better. And the more things that you, your partner maybe helps you be better at it. Let's say, let's say you're not a very patient person and they're extremely patient. That's going to help you become more patient. Doesn't necessarily mean they don't like the other person. They just want something fresh. Avoidance don't like closeness and intimacy for them. It's like invading their space. I agree. I've read that. I have more secure attachment with anxious tendencies. We both communicated our flaws. She told me she struggled with re with receiving love, hence why she has found God recently. Wow. I would, you know what? <laughs> If someone says they have they struggle receiving love, there's enough hurdles in relationships. I don't know how you're going to change that. You really got to listen to people because you're like, am, am I going to take that on to try to sell this person that love's not a struggle? Why and there's for love to be a struggle, there had to be someone that disappointed her that she loved, and now she looks at loving as something of taking a chance. And she needs to get to that root before you guys can start something. Is why I was patient, but I didn't put pressure, express my needs, and we both did meet them and made it work. I'm pretty positive she'll reach out a couple of months, and if not, then so be it. Well, that's a good outlook. Dark Knight, you can try new things with your current partner to role play fantasies different settings i don't buy the variety excuse well that's your prerogative judy jack i did have a client in the past that was very conservative she was a woman late 20s and they had they had intimacy issues they had boredom issues and he ended up breaking up with her and she was a bit surprised because she was a catch she had a lot going for her she was attractive and she knew it and she was shocked and she was hurt. She was upset. And guess what she was saying? Oh, I would have done this in the bedroom and I would have done that and I would have tried this and I would have done this and I would have done that. 
And then she found out she, she had a seed to the problem of why she had trouble with intimacy and she, it took the breakup for her to realize what it was. And it was, it was a psychological thing that happened to her when she was younger. And once I'm not going to share that, but she, she shared that and, and it was crystal clear. And then all of a sudden she was going into all these ideas and I'll tell you what, it wasn't going to bring back her boyfriend, but it made it clear to her that that was going to be important in a future relationship and that it couldn't be neglected again. And to find out why she had neglected it in the past. And there was a very specific reason for it. That only works to a certain extent, especially when one of the partners doesn't take care of themselves. Well, that's a whole nother ball game. That's a whole nother ball game, Dark Knight. Yeah. Well, and there's, and there's certain, um, there's certain um, couples where someone will go, let's do this, that's exciting. And it just doesn't, it, it turns out that it's not exciting because you just don't view that person in that way. Or you try, but it doesn't work. Or someone goes, I don't like doing your fantasy. I want to do my fantasy. Absolutely. People take advantage when they can. It doesn't have to be in a negative way, but people will push the limits. And most They will. There's dominant people. There's submissive people. There's weak people. There's strong people. And then someone will go, I can't believe that person did that. How do you... How do you highlight a name, by the way? Someone else could put that in the note. Dark Knight. Well, they're not probably the right pattern. Well, I think people get tired of each other because we always we're, we are always evolving as humans and we change from one stage to the next. We're always changing just like natural. Well, Hazel, people change based on their environments. And their environments are these. The neighborhood you live in, so if you change where you live, and by the way, you could just change from living downtown in a city to living on the waterfront, and things will change a little bit for you. Your work. Now with COVID, a lot of people are at home, so that's kind of mixed, but not everyone. Your other environments are where you go in your leisure, where you go for exercise, where you go for camaraderie. So for example... Someone might go play basketball. I, th when I was a kid, I used to play basketball at a park or a local school, and there would be a group of kids there playing. That was my camaraderie. That was an environment to be in. Now, some people's environment is going to a bar five days a week. What do they get there? Camaraderie. So if you, for example, if you're someone that looks at your environments that you're in, that's dictating a lot of who you are and what you believe in. And that's why when someone moves to a new city, state, or country, things change really quick. Things change really, really quick. Show me the world's hottest supermodel and I'll introduce you to the someone that is tired of her. <laughs> Facts of life. Dark Knight, I think you're right. Me too, Mac, I'm a creator of habit. And not everyone's like that, Jen. So be it. So, but I have been in situations where I don't like, I don't like my the places I'm going to regularly. I've had places like that, but that's how I am. And I'll know, like, like the places I go to, I'll know everyone that works there, friendly, and this and that. I'll try, I'll go try new places, but I don't like to do it a lot. I don't like, and that one thing that surprises people probably, I don't like to travel a lot. But that's not big on my list when people are like, oh, did you, do you want to do a trip to Europe and go to every country? No. Sounds exhausting. Sounds expensive, and I live near a world-class beach. If I'm going to go on a really big vacation, I'd rather go visit my parents for a month. Someone would go, oh, I'd never want to see my parents for a month. That's why everyone's different. But going on long vacations where it's tic-tac-toe and you always have to go somewhere new every day, it's not exciting to me. That's me, but I have never cheated, and I love thinking. I love hiking, traveling, and adventure. I get bored. Well, I commend you. I commend you. I'm just saying it's more likely for people like that because of their mindset. I feel most comfortable with reliable and stable. Oh, my gosh. I did catch a live 
first time ever, Jennifer Martin. Well, welcome, welcome, Jennifer. I think I've seen you in the comments a few times. Let me know if you have any specific questions. I'm about an hour in, but I still got time. I still got uh, some energy flowing here. It was an interesting topic today. One of the things that really got me, though, that about this Gottman method, and again, if you guys want to see this video later on or look in the notes, I do have a link to his website, The Gottman Method, and a link to a 40-plus-minute 40, 40 talk that he gives on his research uh, in his work, and it's good. Um, but but what, I was, <laughs> what I felt like that gets overlooked is I think his research and his suggestions are going to be best for people that are most like him. Do, 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 you, do, you, know, do you know what I mean by that? I didn't, I didn't feel like there wasn't anyone. This guy's probably in his 60s. Um, he's a therapist, so he's highly understanding and very open-minded. Um, I wouldn't call him the most masculine of characters. Um, and there was a certain demographic graphic in the audience that was very 35 to 45, predominantly Caucasian. I think there was a couple of Indian people in there. A couple, everyone was in like a suit, like a shirt and tie, very professional looking, well-groomed. So there, there was a certain group of people that would maybe embrace the ideas that he had or have similar issues. And some of this, some of the anecdotal ideas of people's arguments were very <laughs> small. He, you know, he's like, if my, um, if my wife comes in and goes in the morning and goes, I can't believe you left water in the microwave because it's squeaking, and she gets really angry, and he goes, and, and I'm, I'm thinking to myself, it's just like stuff like that people aren't going to relate to in their problems. There's a lot bigger problems in relationships than that. What's lost is... The fact that whoever you're getting advice from, make sure make sure a lot of their ideals line up with yours. I think the modern world has the lost genuine authentic connection, something internet can't give, no instant gratification can resolve. Simplicity always breeds true joy. Well, that's pretty poetic, Alberto. Where are you at in the world, bud? I don't know if you've have you been on the live stream before, Mr. Rodriguez? I've been watching your videos, love your conversations. I'm just listening for now, not sure where to start, LOL. Okay. Well, the the floor is open for you. If you have a topic in the future you want me to touch on or if you want to mention something about your breakup story, just out of curiosity, because I know Judy, Jack, Rob, and Jen really like the live streams. Being someone new to the channel, Miss Jennifer Martin, uh, do you prefer the live streams or do you prefer uh, the videos about stories? Or now recently I've had Aleph cut um, parts out of the live stream that are more story-based so that people don't have to watch, I don't know, the hour and a half or hour and 40 minutes. Yes, live streams are the best. I enjoy them. It's kind of funny because I've had people like, you need to switch that up so you can get more coaching clients. Um Never been on here. Opened opened up YouTube. I watched a video on LDR breakups, and then it popped up. You are live. I clicked on it. Okay. Connecticut. Nice. Home of uh, Who's the Boss TV show back in the day. I enjoy the dark night, even though physical attraction is very important. It's not the only form. Example, someone with a very creative, internally challenged style can be create, attractive to the hot model example. Mm. Mm. Judy Jack, it's, it's different for everyone. I think that um, a lot of, uh, which a lot of people are, a lot of ego-based people are going to go for looks. 
doesn't mean that you know non ego based people don't but they're going to look they're going to go for like the highest level of looks because that's not just going to feed their ego but it's also going to give them uh, recognition and so the other thing that's really interesting judy jack especially people that late 30s early 40s if they've had a divorce or a long relationship and they were neglected in their relationship in some way rather than the idea of like we have this idea of abuse manipulation verbal abuse physical abuse which is horrible uh, but there are situations where someone will go, we didn't sleep together for five years. And you're like, what? And it was really bad. Now that individual, when they become single, guess what they're looking to do? <laughs> A lot of times they're looking to make up for lost time any way they can do it. They're reading every dating book. They're, And then when they get their gusto or when they start to look better and feel better and stuff like that, and if they're in the right environment that's uh, reciprocal to their needs, uh, they'll go nuts. It's almost like a you know kid having sugar for the first time or something. Homie, homie tight talks about the four horsemen and different couples discussing the hidden burden as couples. I highly re recommend it. Okay, this is also by Gottman. So Hazel, you're a big fan of the Gottman method. Okay. I'm liking the live. I have sort of noticed I rely on your videos, though, each night. I would have watched live more, just hadn't seen you on live till tonight. Oh, no problem. No. <laughs> uh, just feedback's good. If you got a story you want to share, send it in. Don't be shy. If someone has a great personality, they're instantly more attractive for me, more than looks. Oh, sure. People underrate how people carry themselves. There's a great um, Amy Cutter. Posture is a big thing. Posture and body language, you don't think it, but subconsciously, subconsciously, um, it affects attraction. It really does. It really does. Um, but people need to get in touch with, I think a big one for, for people is not being aware when someone's not attracted to you and just letting it go. <laughs> Do you know, what I, you know what I'm saying? Um, I, I, yeah, have you ever been around people, especially being a guy myself and uh, living in different areas and, and uh, being single off and on in my life too and stuff like that and going out with friends and whatnot. It's like the amount of, the amount of people that just don't, especially some, some guys that are, you're like, she's not interested in you. I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't say that, but like, she's not that attracted to you, but they just don't stop. I think, I think uh, Corey Wayne talks about it in his book that there's, there's individuals that are receptive to you or attracted where they hold eye contact or they smile back at you. Rob, you'll know this because you, you follow Corey pretty, pretty devoutly. Um, I've read his book once or, or maybe I did. Maybe I went over it twice. Maybe I did. I did a note session on the show, though. Um, do you know what I'm talking about, Rob? What, what does Corey Wayne say? Because you'll know because you read it like eight times you told me or something. But he says... When you make when you make eye contact and you you get a smile back or you get met eye contact that holds, then that's probably someone that's receptive or most likely attracted to you also. That doesn't mean they're just going to hook up with you, but you know what I mean. Then there's someone that might look at you, then look away, then look again. That also is supposed to mean attraction. And then there's some neutral ones. But then there's some people that just look at you. It's not a very friendly face or they don't even look at you at all. Attached by Amir Levine and the four agreements. The, f the four agreements, isn't that the, uh, that's a different book. The four agreements is, um, isn't that uh, Castaneda?
Also, the creativity and intellectual thought process they use when attracting you. Mm. Hazel says, I study psychology. Is that your line? Is that your field of work? If I may ask, Hazel. Where are you at in the world, Hazel? Uh, speak softly, carry a big stick. Isn't that what the great Teddy Roosevelt said? Or is that what Franklin Roosevelt said? I've watched and read so much on attachment styles. What's something good to read or watch to learn about that? Well, that's that's uh, ironic because I don't um, I know about attachment styles, but I don't read into them heavily because I believe for what I hang my hat on, which is helping you through a breakup. Or recently, I've evolved into helping people find um, find their purpose or find out what they want to do with their life beyond the relationship. I've I've actually had clients come back to me and had long talks about that. Um, some sometimes. I'm not against the attachment theories. I just don't want you to put too much weight on it because then you identify you identify with something that is a label. So this is my this is my issue with it, if you will, Jennifer, is that you go, Oh, I'm an avoidant attachment or I'm this. But then somehow because you say that you believe that it can't be changed. It's not malleable. And so you kind of easy chair into that instead of going, I don't like being this way. I want to work on this. Or you go, my partner's avoidment and I'm this. So that's just how we are. It could, it puts a, it puts a box. There's only four theories, if I'm correct, right? So it puts a box around people, and I just think people are more intricate, and I think that there's more details that need to be gone over in your breakup that don't involve labels that will help you sort through it. Because if you you wear this attachment cloak around for the rest of your life, I don't know if that serves you. I, I don't know if that I, because it, especially if it's negative, it's like, well, I'm just this kind of attachment person. It's like, okay, that sounds pretty negative. Yeah, that's how I am. Okay, do you want to change that? Well, that's just how I am according to the book. Okay. And I'm not saying that about you. That's just my, when people come to me and they're like, well, I'm this and she's this. I'm a, a avoidant and she's a this. Okay, what did, does that change anything from the breakup? Well, now I understand why we broke up. Okay, that those are very, it's kind of like saying I'm an Aquarius and Jen's a Capricorn, so we'll never work out. Because to me, when I was reading attachment theory sometimes, and I know it's I know it's research-based and all that other stuff, and I know there's some good points there, and I know some people line up with that stuff quite a bit. I remember when I read it, I'm like, I could be three different ones of these. Just depends on what I want to believe. At the heart of a breakup, though, is like what happened? What were the actions? What are the feelings right now in your individual situation? You get into these attachment theories. It's like I'm a Warriors fan. I'm a Niners fan. You know what I mean? You, you, you put yourself in this box. Why do I say that? Because it's like I follow this sports team. So that's the team I'm on. That's the team I'm riding with right if you go if you, you if you choose in a, and you're choosing which one suits you when you choose when you choose the one you're like oh this lines exactly up with my partner this lines up exactly with who i am you're choosing one of those and then it's a choice to make it true or not or to go i don't think i want to be like this anymore No matter what it is about someone, something about them must be attractive to you. If there isn't that attraction, they can be the best thing on earth and you'll still not want them. Yeah, you need attraction. Absolutely. There was, there was someone recently in a live coaching call. I don't know if you guys remember. And the guy was saying, he kept saying sorry. He kept going, well, she isn't that attractive. But she's really nice and this and that. I'm like, so what are you doing in her favor by going out with her? What he, was, what he was conveying is I can't do better and this is the only intimacy I can get right now and 
you know, she's done this, this, and this wrong. I go, what's your attraction level on a one to 10? I don't know, like a three or four. That's a problem, dude. You know, but, and by the way, you don't have to apologize to everyone, you know, like she's not that good looking. Well, someone out there, right, Dark Knight? There's, there's plenty of people that find someone attractive that you don't find attractive. <laughs> it's common, right? I mean, I've had friends before. I definitely would be like in my head, but at the same time, if my friend's happy and is treated well, who cares? Good for him. Good for her. Yeah, it's a one on one of interest. And what what I, what I meant by that, Rob, about the Corey Wayne thing is like sometimes someone's just not interested in you. That's not personal. It's not rejection. It's just they don't find you attractive and they, they're not interested. To turn those people around, if you're a pickup artist or one of these kinds of things, can it happen? But the Yes, but the percentages are extremely low. And a lot of it, I've said before, you don't realize it, but a lot of people subconsciously associate your look with someone they've seen before. And if it's someone they like, then you're more attractive. I've even seen this on one of these YouTube videos that a lot of times people are attracted to more common looking faces than they are to someone that's eccentrically different. If that makes sense. I, maybe I said that wrong. But their features are, are more normal. We've all heard the symmetry beautiful thing. But if they're, they're, their features are something that you've commonly seen before in your society or your culture. Check out the personal development school. Ties is very good. She has videos on YouTube. Ah, Don Miguel Ruiz. That's his name. He's a doctor, right? He's uh, Mexican. Yeah, The Four Agreements is great. I've talked about that book on this show. Uh-huh. Is that something that's part of the Gottman method, or is that just something separate? You're generalizing people and labeling them when everyone comes from different walks of life. I agree with you on attachment styles. That's, that's my point. I don't have a problem when someone... I just, from my line of work and the way I conduct things, when I'm being a coach, I'm wearing that cap, and you come to me and you say, hey, Mac, I want your help. I want your opinion. I want your take. Can you unpack this with me? I put the attachment styles to the side. Someone else might, I've heard people on YouTube, I've heard a therapist, that's their specialty. Hey, let's find out what attachment style you are and then go from there. Okay. Try that out. I don't like doing that. That's just, per that's, personally, that's not, what I like doing. I find that it's, um, frankly, it's a little lazy because it's like, all right, we could just put you in this box and then we can figure out who you line up with, but you only have four choices. Uh, you know, <laughs> it's the whole problem. <laughs> oh man, I shouldn't even say it. Yeah, there should be more, op I'll just say there should be more options. The best thing may be focusing on your own attachment style to make yourself as secure as possible. That's another, Judy Jack, that's another point because a lot of times people will identify what their partner is. And, and they might be right based on that. What's really interesting about these attachment styles, someone came up with this. This was invented. It was invented. It's not necessarily 100% true. Someone did a study, they studied a certain group of people and they go, this is true for all human beings. That's a bold statement in my book. Four styles. Someone invented it. Someone, people go, oh yeah, th this is how they are. No, someone wrote a book and invented it. They, they made up those names to give you some kind of cohesion for you to understand things better. And then labels make it easier for people to go, oh, yeah, you're this or you're that. But human beings are way more intricate in my experience. When we unpack things, Jen's done a coaching with me before. When we unpack things, we get way into other things, way into other things, way into other rabbit holes from your breakup. It's not so simple to just to go, oh, I'm an introvert, I'm an extrovert, or oh, I'm this and that. Eh, let's get a little deeper. Let's get into some details. Let's have a conversation about this. Let's talk about you. 
Let's talk about how you look at people. It's true. People can use attachment styles as an excuse. It's more about understanding, not excusing. I got you, Jen. That's a good way to put it. And I'm not, I, well, I am discounting attachment styles. I shouldn't say I'm not. I am. For me, for me, for, for the way I conduct my work, for the way I like to go about things. That doesn't mean if someone views those things as useful or helpful for them or another therapist or coach uses them, I don't have a problem with it. Uh, that's just my own outlook. Someone I know always wants such a relationship, but always runs when the girl is going to move in, begs her and freaks out over and over. Well, there's a Jennifer. That's really simple. If I was in a coaching with that person, there would, I, there would be a sequence of questions I would ask. And probably what would unlock that would be, when did you first have this problem? Uh, secondly, it would be what in your childhood is related to this problem but one of the big ones would be when when did you first choose to have this problem and the other one would be uh when have you witnessed this with your something similar to this problem with your mother and then the next question with your father and then the next question with your siblings and so there's a seed there that once he and and it, if it's not his parents then it's his first relationship there was something tragic or traumatic where someone moved in with someone and it all went to hell some people are 100% sold on attachment styles. <clears throat> people, because a lot of people like it when you can just put something in a box and go, oh yeah, and they like generalizations. I hate this worldview of alphas versus beta. All the generalizations, my favorite book is Psycho-Cybernetics, Maxwell Maltz. I know the book. It's all about self-image. We are all unique. You can't compare yourself with other BU. Psycho cybernetics. Yeah, Maxwell Maltz was a um, good knowledge, Alberto. Um, plastic surgeon, I believe in the 60s, if I'm correct. Um, and they claim psycho cybernetics was one of the first quote unquote self improvement books. And the way he came across his research was he would do plastic surgery. He was considered himself really good at what he did, I believe. And I believe it was in New York that he was a plastic surgeon. And he would say that he said that one of the things he kept coming across is he would do someone's nose or their eyes. And I think even at that point in the 60s, a lot of times plastic surgery was done for people that had bad accidents and stuff, too. I don't think it was quite and I could be wrong on this. This is an assumption. It was quite as popular as it is now for, you know, someone that just has money or something like that, where I think before it was it was done quite often for um birth defects and uh, car accidents and things like that. Anyhow, in, in being a doctor, he said that his work or the satisfaction with his work would be directly affected by an individual's outlook of themselves. So how they view his work would, you know, how they view the nose job being life changing or helpful, or they were beautiful again, would have to do how they looked at themselves. And then I heard this joke once cracked to me because it's so true. If you're ugly, you're ugly. Don't talk about inner beauty. Men don't walk around wearing x-rays. <laughs> okay. Every pot has its cover. There's always someone for everyone. Absolutely. Absolutely. There is. There is. Uh, there are alpha and beta characteristics. They, there's just the way it is. However, some people have no idea about what both archetypes mean or how they are defined. Um, sure. I know Rob uses alpha and beta quite a bit. Uh, I understand it. I don't use that terminology a lot because I, again, I'm more into the idea that human beings are intricate and there's, there's men that could be 80% alpha and have 20% beta moments when a cat dies on the road or, uh, you know, they like gardening uh, you know, which wouldn't be alpha. So, um, but I understand. I see what you mean. I think attachment styles can be a label. I see then, I see them blame for me. That's why I asked. Good question. And I'm not, I hope it doesn't come off 
you know, someone could come on and talk to me on the live stream and be all in on attachment styles. And I would tell them the same thing. And if they went on and on and on, I'd say, Hey, look, I'm, you know, I agree to disagree. And if that's, and I would be open to hearing more about it from an export or someone that hangs their hat on it. I would be skeptical, but I would be open to it. I wouldn't be like, Oh, this is total bullshit. That's just my viewpoint right now. Okay. If guys, if a guy attracts you through your mind, is that beta or alpha? I wouldn't even answer that because I just, uh, I, I wouldn't consider it one or the other for me, Judy Jack. Um, I don't put that high regard on it. I recommend codependent no more, but wow, you do, you read a lot. Melody, uh, BD, and I never knew I had a choice by Gerald McCoy and Mary Ann Schneider. Um, Codependent, obviously, is for someone that's in a relationship with an addict or an alcoholic. That's an interesting title. I never knew I had a choice because that's actually something if you, I don't know if you've seen much of my channel, but I always tell people, where's your power? In my experience, people are attracted to those that make them feel good, whatever it may be. Best thing is to be happy in your life as that will exclude and how you behave and that's attractive. Uh, simple advice, but very true. I know when I was in sales, that was one of the big things. People always remember how you make them feel. Um, what I would add to that is monitor how people make you feel. Um, and sometimes we have friendships or colleagues or family members that we spend a lot of time with and we think we have to for some kind of outside reason, myself included. I've been involved uh, in friendships or business partnerships where looking back, I didn't really like the person, but I felt like, oh, you know what? We make money together or um, this is gonna help out uh, my career or something like that. And not a shallow kind of way, but you know, like we work together, maybe I can learn some things. But looking back, some of these, some of these people, I just really didn't like them. I didn't like hanging out with them because the way they acted or their viewpoints were so different. Uh, yes, it's hard. The first four styles, I took a test once and the answers to choose from weren't like they totally fit myself. So the test felt inaccurate. And I think that's probably why um, the first time I read on attachment theories, I just felt like none of them applied to me 100%. Uh, it's Sigma. I ain't, I ain't to be a Sigma destroys beta alpha concepts. Aim to be. I'm a little confused on that. I'll have to look up Sigma. Sigmas do not destroy beta or alpha concepts. I don't know enough about those. I'm thinking like Sigma Chi, like fraternities, because my one of my good friends when I was younger from high school was in a fraternity. Uh, I don't know enough about those to speak on them. It's a different way to operate as an archetype. And then there's Omega. Uh, there's some good videos out explaining Sigmas. Okay. A sigma male is a man who is neither an alpha male or a beta male, but rather a man who refuses to play the game altogether. Where an alpha male is the top of the hierarchy and a beta male is at the bottom of it. The sigma male is even, isn't even in the hierarchy altogether. Okay. I know they were nonconformity plus more. Hmm. Well, if I had to pick one out of the three, I'd pick Sigma for myself, not knowing much about it. I know they were stuck in a marriage for 20 years and felt like they couldn't leave. And finally they did. But it cost him a lot. He worked for his whole life. I think he's... So you're coming to my channel for someone else or for yourself, Jennifer? Is this one of those things where you're mentioning someone else, but you're talking about yourself? <laughs> Are you just a good, caring friend that's seeking out information for your friend? I know they were stuck in a marriage for 20 years and felt like they couldn't leave. And finally they, they did, but it cost him a lot. He worked his whole life. I think he is afraid he will get stuck again. Um, well, there's a lot of men out there. If they've, if they felt like they got the short end of the stick on a marriage, 
and lost a lot of money that are very, very gun shy about getting into a new relationship and rightfully so. Um, and if that's the case, I mean, there's, there's been women that I've coached before that are in relationships that they're not breaking up, but they go, why, why was he, why won't he have kids with me? Or why doesn't he want to get married? He already had two kids and he's been married before. And so why wouldn't he marry me if he's been married before? Well, that's actually the reason because his model of marriage that he thought was going to be forever, he got burned. And so a lot of times people get burned one time, hence you get burned on the stove and you don't touch the stove again. They don't usually try again. What the short answer would be, uh, he's, it's going to take him more time to make a decision like that. I really think from experience, and you're not going to be able to talk him into it. I really think from experience is that when someone is right for you, it goes well from the beginning. And when you have so many obstacles, he's not the one, no matter how much we don't want to admit it. Uh, it should go smooth and good in the beginning, but it still could, you still could be wrong. It's always a discovery mission. There is no certainty in relationships. But yes, absolutely, Hazel, when people come to me and they tell their story and they say it was absolutely wonderful in the beginning, I say, good for you. That's the way it should be. You shouldn't be, you, you shouldn't be um, dodging potholes in the, right from the get-go. <laughs> you like that one, Judy Jack. Uh, scientifically, beta cells are stronger than alpha cells. Food for thought. I'm always late. What's up, Skinner? Yes, people always remember how you make them feel as well as how you accept them without trying to change them. That's a great close, Judy Jack. God, we missed you from this live stream. Where have you been? That's underrated, and I don't say that. I don't say that enough, actually. Thanks for saying that because I, I agree with you. It seems obvious to me that because it's some it's a way I've lived for a long time, not always. Uh, remember how you make them feel, how you interact with people, but how you accept them without trying to change them. That is so big. And one of the ways that I've come to realize that is the fact that you don't know people as well as you think you know them based on the small sample size you've had with them. You don't know why they are the way they are. And so when you're puzzled by someone being a jerk or impatient or easily angered, take a step back. Sales, that's my issue. I've done sales my whole life. Love social dynamics, but my friend noted to me, my personality focuses on outcome. That's due to my job, but it makes sense. I tend to feel I can control outcome in a relationship, and that's not realistic. Blew my mind when he said that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I've talked about that before, Alberto. I've said before, the thing about relationships, if you're in sales... I don't know if this applies to whatever you sold. Uh, you can you can do, I forgot how they fra phrased this when I was, because I was in sales well before I was a real estate agent for a few years, but the training, they, they said concentrate on the activities, not the outcomes, because the activities over time are going to pay off. But but you do check the results. You do check how much you made, what your sales were. There's all kinds of analytics on that. There's all, when you do sales, Alberto, there's all kinds of things you can measure your success on. Relationships are not like that. And it's, and unfortunately, um, people will surprise and shock you that you thought you knew. Um, and a lot of times if you were in sales and you're good at sales, you feel like you read people really well, probably. <clears throat> but you know what's interesting is that I don't think people realize that there's only so many things you're good at and the things that you're good at, you practiced or you had experience with them. Think about this for a moment. Stay with me. We've got 14 on deck, six likes. If you want to make a donation, it's always appreciated an hour and a half here. But think about this for a moment. 
and I've talked about this before, people that aren't confident, they don't know one thing they're good at. You only need a few things to be good at, and you can have confidence, right? Really good at. Okay, there's not a lot of people that are renaissance, man, that are good at like 18 different things. That's not true. You can, you, you, If you're a chef, you're a really good cook, you can be a good parent and a good son, and maybe you maybe go to the gym every day or something like that. That's enough. That's enough to have a, a pretty fulfilling life. Now, listen. Here's what people don't realize. You want to work, let's say you want to work on your body. This is very common, right? I want to get a six pack or I want to have more strength or I want to look, look better, whatever that is. Then you got to go to the gym and you got to change your diet. Okay, yeah, I know. I can go on YouTube. I, there's, there's all this information out there, but you got to do it, right? And in the beginning, you're going you're gonna, to, depending on how fat you are or out of shape you are or how much you've neglected exercise, it's going to suck, because you're not good at it. Why aren't you good at it? Because you didn't practice. Because you didn't make it a habit. Now, there's certain individuals out there that are very blessed, that have naturally toned bodies. They're far and few between. But over time, they still will have to be habitual about it. And they're good at it. And they it's not by accident that people look good. These people are the same people that eat salads that exercise daily, and then someone's like, wow, you look really good. What have you been doing? The same things most people have been doing. Now, here's the thing. When you get into relationships, a lot of people aren't good at them. Why? Well, for starters, they didn't have a lot of practice. They maybe have only had two serious relationships, and one of them was a year, and one of them was with someone that was highly manipulative or their parents' relationship was a bad model to follow. I'll give you an example. I am not very good at handiwork. What does that mean? The air conditioner's broke, um, hanging a picture on the wall, um, anything with tools, I don't even do it. And I, people have been like, wow, you don't even, like, you can't even. My father, when I was a kid, he was a truck driver. We went fishing. We went hunting. Never, I don't, we never had a handy project in my fucking life. He always, he always hired a handyman. I never had any exposure to it. It was always just call someone else. And I've had a couple of girlfriends like, hey, can you fix that? Nah. I don't know anything about cars, about fixing, like anything. I'll just take it to a specialist. Because my role model when I was a kid, same thing. I have no experience. Oh, you're bad at that. No, it's not that you're bad about it. You're inexperienced. You never put any work. If I wanted to learn how to be a, a knowledgeable, I don't know, mediocre mechanic, I could go on YouTube and, and learn a lot of things like changing my oil and different things like that. I have no interest in it. Circling back to this idea that, you know, you're, you're having... Let's say you're saying like, oh, I've had this shocking relationship or I didn't know how to read this woman. It just has to do with you not exploring that area of knowledge. Hence the reason why you come to a channel like this. I've read a lot of books, watched a lot of documentaries, a lot of interviews. I don't know how many people I've talked to about their breakups, but it's got to be damn near in a thousand now through live, live coaching sessions, through reading their story right? So I have some experience now. And so I see things a lot clearer. It doesn't mean I'm a fucking love guru or a psychic. I put in some work. I put in some work on this. And this is the equivalent of this last three and a half years or whatever I've been on YouTube and having a thousand videos and posting every, every story that I read and whatnot. That was my baptism into this industry or this field, if you will, whatever you want to call it. I shared it. And if I went to a school to get some kind of certification, I don't know if they can match the amount of people that I've talked to and the amount of stories that I've unpacked, right? So when you think to yourself, I didn't see this coming, you just don't have that much experience probably. 
you weren't filtering for the things that you would filter and someone that might be someone that's going to buy something from you that you're specialized in selling. And so that, that's when I would, if I, Alberto, if I had a live coaching session with you, I'd go, oh, read this book, this book, and this book. And then also take accountability for not realizing this, or I would reassure you that you didn't do everything wrong. Because sometimes guys go, oh, I did something wrong. No, nope, you just were the damaged soul. You just were with someone that didn't line up with you. That's something you need to know to move forward. So just like anything else, relationships is a subcategory of human life. And some people are better at it than others, not because they're naturals, because they've had good models, mentors, coaches, therapists. They've read some good books. They've mixed it all together and put it into action. And then, even then, Alberto, it still can fail. But the person that fails, that has the knowledge, gets through it quicker. Oddly, there's a frat called Beta, Beta, Beta. Wow, that's not nice. Is that one of the ones from Nerds? Yes, losing money in divorce will make you very gun shy and prevent fo and prevention focused. It's traumatic, dude. Judy. It's traumatic. I've, I've known guys. And what people don't realize in America, the rest of the world doesn't operate that way. The rest of the world doesn't say, okay, you're getting a divorce. Um, uh, you got to give your wife X, Y, Z, this, that, and the other, or vice versa, by the way. Vice versa, by the way. There are women out there that have to pay men. It's not as common. But th th this isn't how, how the rest of the world operates. This is something that is um, part of Western culture and extremely um, uh, scary for a lot of men or women that are the breadwinners. I know, I know a case where there was a woman that was the provider. She was making 180 a year, 190 a year. Her husband went on disability. Her husband ended up being a stay-at-home dad, which was admirable, noble, by the way. Um, she ended up losing interest in him. She wanted to get a divorce. And guess what he said? You'll pay me monthly, and we're splitting the house. And she went, what? I thought you would move out and get an apartment. And he went, nope. I'm not going quietly, and I already talked to three lawyers. Guess what? They're still together. Not sure if that uh, applies to the Gottman method. Money talks. The way things are going these days, marriage is more of a risky liability than a happily ever after dream. It was marked to be over many, many years. Well, I'll tell you what, the people that have a lot of money, a lot of money, a lot of money, millionaires, billionaires, whatever, it's just a dent in the door for them. I've, I've met guys that wrote checks for $4 million and was like, I had to buy her out, and they don't give a fuck. They're not bitter about it at all because they got enough money to, to, to move forward. Do you have a specific time you usually do a live? It's 1, 10 a.m. where I'm at. Where are you at in the world, Jennifer? Uh, it's usually not this late, but I started. I'm going on two hours right now. This has been a good one. 11 a.m. usually. If you want to, um, I don't know if I have it here. Here's the uh, Discord. You can join that, which is an ongoing chat with people from the live stream and people that like my channel. I'm probably going to post a schedule there soon. I also have Instagram, Coach Mac McCarthy. So you can check those. Uh, that's a great argument for for slowing things down, not really knowing when, who someone is for a while. You almost have to blow a few relationships followed by a ton of introspection to become a better at it or be tremendously observant as a learner. I don't know if you blow it or if you're on the opposite end of a... I've known people that just have been shocked. 
or they've been hurt. Yeah. It's not necessarily that you, you blow it. It's just that it didn't work out. It wasn't favorable. The best way to learn is from failures or being shocked or being hurt really, because it motivates people. Pioneer Caddy, who's that in regards to? <laughs> Ohio. I'm in Thailand right now. Jennifer and I got like three people that live here from Ohio. One guy's from Youngstown. Uh, but he's lived here for 20-something years. Jeff Bezos is a perfect example. He got divorced, and he isn't the richest man in the world. I think had to pay like $78 billion. Billion or million? Whatever. I just know in people it's not as big as it's it's tough, man. Oh, you're talking about Pioneer Caddy, you're talking about the story I just told you? I'm sorry, yeah. I'm near Youngstown. Yeah, this guy that lives here. Youngstown, Ohio. That's where the deep Bartolos are from, I think. They own the 49ers. I believe the Youngstown, Ohio is near Canton, Ohio, where the football hall of fame is. Uh yeah, the um isn't that crazy, Pioneer Caddy, though? Is that a good story? Because like people always go, oh, men always get fleeced. Oh, men always get screwed up. Not always. Not always. And I'm telling that's a true story, Pioneer Caddy. And he and he planned that shit, too. She was like, oh, I thought you'd move into an apartment. Kids want to stay with me. You know, the list goes on. He goes, uh, we're selling the house, and I'll be taking some money each month, and I'm moving away. So no more Mr. Dad. And it got real, real quick. I mean, it literally turned around within a millisecond. And a lot of guys and women that have kids, someone folds. Right? Some things you can't come back from. Like, you, like you're going to get a divorce. It's done. Get it. But, like, uh, it's just been boring. It's this. But someone doesn't fold. And someone goes, listen. I'm not giving you the house. It's going to be a court date and we're going to go through it. And you're not going to get more than I get. And a lot of times people will make more of an effort to make it work. Yeah, but Jeff Bezos' wife was long-term with him since young. In other words, she wasn't a gold digger. I get it. Billion. Amazon owner just looked it up. He paid $38 billion. He was the richest man in the world and now he isn't. Wow. Well, I'll tell you what. I wouldn't want to be called Amazon owner. I'd want to be called the best philanthropist in the world. He should be donating money uh, eight hours a day. That's ridiculous, that amount of money. Wouldn't that cause some resentment on her end? Maybe she stays because she doesn't want to lose her assets. I get it, Skinner. I'm not saying it's ideal. I'm not saying it's ideal. I'm just saying... that it's incentive based that she had it in her head obviously that he would give in like you can have the house because the kids are with you and I've, I've met guys like this oh, i let my wife keep the house but she can't sell it till the kids are 18 and then right when the kids are 18 she's got a new boyfriend and they sell the house and they move somewhere and the guy's like fuck that's not what i thought was going to happen so what, could there be some resentment there? Sure. Sure. But the guy's point was, I'm not going to leave anything out on the floor for you. I'm not going to give you a, a, a yellow brick road to divorce me because you're no longer happy with me. We got three kids. I've been a stay-at-home parent. And just because I'm a guy doesn't mean I'm like, oh, I'm just going to move in the apartment and take it like a man. Nope. We're selling the house. You can move in an apartment, and so can I. And guess what? Yeah, maybe I'll see the kids on the weekend. You really want them? And you know what? I don't know if I don't know if he was sincere that that's what he really wanted, but it was a hell of a game of poker. And he, she came back to him. And you're right. Maybe when the kids are 18, she flies the coop. Maybe she develops a plan. I don't know. I don't know. But it's a it's a case where he was playing to win. They say divorce is so expensive because it's worth it. Depends on the couple. 
depends on the couple. I think the main thing, the main thing that would be the worst case scenario is when you stay in a marriage where you're sacrificing a part of your soul, where something's, where something's really wrong, where you really despise being around that person or who they are and what they're about. If you're bored, I think that can be worked on. If you're not having enough intimacy, that could be worked on. Just because it could be worked on doesn't mean it works, too. Uh, some get it wrong, Mac. I don't disagree with him. I just think there's a chance that she isn't serious about the relationship anymore. I get it. Skinner, I, Skinner, I get it. I just think it's an interesting paradox because people always assume um, that only women, only women, or, or only men, ben, only women benefit in those cases. Mm. Saying all this, I've never been married. So someone could easily go, well, you don't know. You're correct. You're correct. I do my best. I listen to people's stories when they're married or with kids. And a lot of people uh, that I talk to, I don't cross into that like, well, you're married, so you have to do this. Your definition of what your obligations to your marriage are different. They are. And I've talked about it before. I think the idea of people getting married till death do us part is a flawed wording because I don't think people are that deep anymore. The guy I know paid alimony child support, gave her the house. She sold it, won the lottery, and he was stuck in campground. He wanted the divorce and said it was worth it. He wasn't happy, but man. See, that's the thing. Did he give in where he gave where he gave a lot more than he needed to to be the bigger man, to be the to be the good guy, to be the bigger person? Or cuz I, I always hear about that. Oh, I gave her the house for the kids and then she sold it. Always hear that. You know, and if who am I to say, because I don't know, I haven't been in that situation where finances are really tight, and if you leave, you don't have anywhere to go. That's tough. That's why I always tell people, tell me your story, and let's talk about it. And I don't get a lot of marriages. They're us Usually, I get them, but a lot of people, I'll tell you, this is, this is going to be interesting to you guys, and I'm going to close with this because I'm getting a little cotton mouth. I'm a little bit parched. It's a better word. I get a lot of guys, especially guys, more than women, that come to me out of a breakup that was their first relationship after a divorce. Why is that? Well, that relationship was great. Intimacy was outstanding. A lot of these guys, uh, mid, uh, mid 30s to late to up to late 40s and they got a woman that's a little bit younger more attracted to it and their intimacy was outstanding they loved it great relationship and then the wheels fall off and they're like what the fuck right so the wheels fall off and then they're like i was just in this 15-year marriage and i'm like oh how'd that go oh me and my wife were okay but we were just friends the last five years or we we ended on the right terms we just we just weren't in love together so the marriage was like, it was done, but then they get in this new relationship where it's lust, it's rose petals and wine glasses, it's peaches and cream, it's hot and it's heavy. And then all of a sudden, like the girl gets in a fight with them and they break up and they're like, what the fuck? Because their model before was like, oh, you know, when you're in a relationship, we can go like 10, 15 years, even if we don't like each other. They have a lot of trouble with that shit. They're like, what? I thought relationships were supposed to be like this. It's a lack of experience. Best to put any extra money into Bitcoin. Don't even bring that up, Rob. Jesus. Had a friend preach to me at $3,000 to buy Bitcoin. He spent three hours on the phone with me. I thought, wonderful idea. This was two or three years ago. Stop it. Stop.
stop it, Rob. All time. All time. <clears throat> All right, folks. I'm gonna be I'm gonna be back on deck tomorrow, eleven AM my time. I'll put it on the Discord early. Thanks for thanks for tuning in. Thanks for the seven likes, the twelve on deck. Jennifer, it's been a pleasure. I guess this is your first time, or at least your first time on a live stream. Uh Chris Boutron, thanks for checking in. 120 million? Jesus Christ. Uh, Alberto, thanks for joining. You've been riding since the beginning. Skinner, it's always a pleasure. Judy Jack, good to see you back on deck. Maybe join the Discord if you like, Judy Jack. Dark Knight, how you doing? Always well. Hazel, thanks for chiming in today. Your psychology experience, the four agreements. Uh, is valued. Alberto, I like the fact that you like cybo cybernetics too. Good knowledge. Chen, always a pleasure. We're both in Aquarius, right? Anyone else here? No, that's about it. Uh, I'll give it to you one more time, bud. Today it'll be in the... Today it's, it's in the... Um, that's a Discord link. Uh, it's also in the the bottom of the uh, notes for the live stream. See you tomorrow. Thanks. It was nice seeing you and your words definitely help. Right on, Jennifer. Keep being you, hon. It's curtains.